Hi, this is Steve Owens, and I've got Amico with me today, who is a singer. And what's interesting, Hi, Steve. you actually worked with some guys that I work with. Who? The Club Jumpers. Oh, yes, the Club Jumpers. They're fantastic. They are in my neck of the woods in San Antonio. So they're just a nice straight drive down south in Texas. And they're super talented, and I am very fortunate to have a promoter who, who knows them and he's going to visit them next week. So, yeah. Actually, Dan and I both worked at the same radio station many years ago. I did. It's uh, KTFM. I was there Small for about world. six years. Yeah. yeah. So how does it feel to see and hear your single uh, reach uh, the top of the charts in the UK? It was astonishing. It wasn't overwhelming, but it was quite joyful and surprising at first that I went into the charts. So you do a lot of DJ servicing for quite several months, actually before it has a chance to get up to the charts, unless you're famous. But if you're like me, yeah, yeah. and I'm not, it takes some time. So I kept bugging my promoter. I'm like, well, where are we? Where are we? And he's okay, here's your report. Here's your report. And then he calls me while I'm on my way to Austin to take take a little trip down there. And he says, you, you're on the chart. You're 29. And then he calls me while I'm in Austin for a couple of days and says, you're already at 12. So I went, I took some bites, went 27, 20, 29, 27, and then 12, like in a very short period of time. Um, and I'm probably telling the story wrong. I'm just going back in my poor memory at this point because I'm overloaded with so many things to do. But it was very fast. And then I, I didn't stay at 12 long either and uh, got to I think position nine and then seven and held that for quite a while. So that was pretty exciting. And then they Fabulous. finally just took me off. They just took me off. That's <laughs> what they do. And your combination of streams. And they look, you get some radio, I think, but it's not, I'm not competing with the bigger stars on that particular chart. But it's a big accomplishment. UK Music Week is not easy to get onto. And it's the top chart in the UK and very much an influential chart. So it was really special to be on there for sure. So tell me about your collaboration process with DJ Sean Finn and the Club Jumpers on the remixes. So basically, I it's not a personal relationship at this point. But with Sean, I've been working with him longer, and he's re retooling Patrick for me, which is my first single, which we took out of distribution to work on it. Reckless is actually my second song that I recorded, and that was with Carlos Beatty, a.k.a. Jackie's Boy. And so the relationship with Sean and I is I speak German, not well, but I grew up in Minnesota, and that was my language that I chose to learn throughout school all the way through high school. And I will send him notes in German and emails and send, send him my promoter. And then my promoter sends them on to him. So that's fun. And he doesn't reply, but he, but he does, he does do excellent work. And so far my personal relationships aren't there. And I think that could change over time. And then my promoter, Jason Dahman also sends things to the club jumpers. And I have a, my first radio interview is queued up, ready to go with Melissa uh, Bonilla at 98.5 Splash FM in New Jersey. So I'm Fabulous. looking forward to that airing. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, actually, I remember when Dan was telling me that he was taking the, taking on that radio station in New Jersey, which is yes. great. Yes, it's in uh, a casino, and it's a top yeah. casino. It's pretty cool. <laughs> so I told Jason I'm going to get there somehow and perform. Why not? Exactly. You have over 430,000 Spotify streams. And how has that impacted your career so far? I I, ha I wrote a Sean Finn wave, which was very interesting. Uh, he has a very active Spotify page, and he fluctuates between 700 and over a million followers on any given week. And so I hit his chart at number, his Spotify uh, list at number five. And so he only shows five of his remixes on his page. And I hit number five. I had been paying attention. I, I just was learning how to track things on Spotify artists. Like you can look all the time. I would look periodically, but I started to look more often. And I noticed that I had 300 streams going on at the same time on Sean Finn's remix. And I was like, what in the heck is going on? So I was like, no, I'm not doing anything. I don't know what's going on. And I was actually just finished recording two more songs with Carlos Beatty in Miami, where we record together in Doral, Florida in particular, but we were staying in Miami and he took me out for my birthday dinner. And so I showed him, he's no way, is that really happening? And I said, yes. And he showed me and uh, I showed him rather. And he was like, what are we doing? And we we're trying to use deduction to figure out how in the heck this is happening and just blowing up. 
and it was just putting streams like crazy on onto my Spotify account. And so he's like, he looked at me, oh, I get, I know it's Sean Finn. Let's check his page. And so there I was on his page and that probably went on for days, but uh, the next day it stopped. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, the next day when I checked again, it was over. I was not at number five anymore, but that was a really a, a turning point for me, qualified me to go on to the UK Music Week promotion, which without it, I wouldn't have probably qualified on the metric side. And, and then from there, the UK Music Week and then DJ Buzz chart in France ran at the same time. And I have a music distribution company that I use a digital platform and called Music Gateway. And they, they were doing some SMM for me. And so I had a viral video going of me singing and it was my brand. So I'm a hat trick woman. So basically it was my brand of fashion, soccer, and music. And I'm original on all of them. I love consignment. I'm a big consignment person. And that's my brand because I'm like, hey, why spend money on stuff you don't have to? And it looks fabulous. So that's more my thing. I've always been like that. I like hunter gather, athletes, athlete, coach, all that kind of stuff. It all fits my personality. And so they put together a, a wonderful social reel and they had both Sean Finn versions and Club Jumpers versions. And we dropped them down. Sean Finn was in London. At the time, we dropped him down into the UK at the time that he was there doing some shows. And then we targeted the US with the club jumpers because we knew we were going to have some radio play coming up and we were doing brand awareness. So it went all the way to 3.8 million and I put a couple of ads on it and it just blew up. And so we knew, hey, that marketing lane is special. So <laughs> that Fabulous. was pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. So those kind of things triangulated the the whole thing. And then I just got a report from a soccer person. I'm very connected in the ecosystem of youth soccer across all aspects from youth to local clubs. And then even you know people at major league soccer and I get continuing education there and I'm an active coach. I heard a report from someone who has a soccer tech company that they're, they have a, a relationship partner who was at the Olympics and heard my songs being spun in the Olympic village. And I was like, that is crazy. That's so cool. <laughs> So, no, it sure yeah. is. It's absolutely great. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm very popular in France. The DJ Buzz promotion, I got a notification probably over a month ago that said I peaked and all my stuff dropped off. And then I started, I just checked to see who else was going on about three weeks ago. And I'm like, wait a minute, I'm back on the chart. So I'm back on two out of the three that I peaked at three, five and five in the top 10. And that is some radio play. It's their national RJC, I believe it's called radio station. And I'm back on number seven and I'm not moving. And I said to Jason, I said, they must really like me in France. He said, yes, they do. So I'm in the, in a current, but new, just newly started radio promotion here in the U.S. And we'll see how it goes. And that's also global, but there's a lot of promotion going on in the U.S. radios market as well. So it's exciting. Yeah. Can you tell me a little bit more about your experience co-writing Reckless with Grammy Award-winning producer Carlos Beatty? I, I can. One of my favorite moments when I think about that experience is I was in a space where I couldn't find parking <laughs> to get to the studio on time. And I'm an on-time, I'm a coach, I'm a mom, I'm an on-time type of gal. And I was not close to that. And so I circled around. So he came out to show me how to get from where I was, where he was familiar, and to get to the studio. And I saw him on the corner across the street and had to wait for the cross crossing signal. And I just knew I could feel his energy. I was like, because I was so basically, wow, this is my second time recording and I'm recording with this guy. What this is really a, an incredibly fortunate event. And so I just felt his warm energy and I was, I, my nervousness just went away. Nervousness from being late, nervousness from doing this. And so we hit it off right away. And I, he gave me a big hug. He says, welcome. I'm glad you found me. And, and he says, we're going to have a great time. And he's just, don't be nervous. Just be yourself, be co hundred percent. And we're going to have a lot of fun and I'm going to help you and walk you through the process. Cause he's a professional developing artist himself. He works with developing artists as part of his ecosystem. And I, I immediately recognized that he had a lot of skills in those areas. So I looked at him and I said, I just pulled my little sense of humor out. And we went up into this recording studio and Art and Kleshi was there. And it was about, I want to say probably five hours start to finish with the whole process. It was quick. It was really quick. And he got, he got, he, I, I'm trained in guided coaching. He had that down. He asked me questions. He challenged me at times to come up with more for lines and really would just do what I do as a coach. And he would ask me a question and he wouldn't say a word. And he just let me 
take my time getting getting to the answer of how I wanted to craft a line or or, or a verse or things like that. And so Reckless came from this idea of mine as a poet. I've been writing poetry since I was seven years old, and I've done it for. I had stuff in college that was recognized and things, but I didn't really have any interest in pursuing that as a career. It was more a personal journey for me. And as of late, I started to write a lot more and decided for the first time in my life I'd always wanted to do was to turn my poetry into lyrics. So I developed my own system and I wrote 305 and I had discipline. So I spent every day writing five or six cohesive ideas with full lyrics, structure, everything else. And I would listen to songs, my favorite songs that I grew up with or I really love now. And I would tamp down on Apple Music, I would tamp down the vocals, and I wouldn't listen to the vocals. And I would write the pentameter to the BPM of the song and whatever it was inspire me to do. And I'd have a title to start. I, I had three, 305 of those. I go into the, in the studio and I've got my backpack and I've got my books and I've got the post-it notes all organized and little titles on each one. So he just went through like a file folder. And he's, ooh, be reckless. Let's do that. And I'm like, okay, sure. So I didn't go in knowing exactly which song I was going to record. And so he played, they were messing around with some composition and they had some stuff prearranged, but they were working. It was very much a work in progress, but they just wanted to have some sounds now because I was brand new and they didn't want to engage me too much in the actual composition based on my experience level. And they started having me listen to it. And all of a sudden I found my way into the song with the perfect vocal phrasing and he just looks at me and he goes amico this is the <laughs> song we're doing so we just the song idea is what i call my concept song ideas because i believe they need to be adapted in a studio environment things get adapted and changed all the time so i, I knew that process anyway with poetry and i knew that I wasn't at all upset that things were going to change and shift and we just started writing on the fly and then he would go in a room and he'd start recording background vocals that kind of thing. And I was like, wow, what is he doing? <laughs> what is he doing? But he was setting the table for the, co the composition to come together. And for me, how he was phrasing and things like that, so I could learn. And then we just wrote a couple of verses, and then he's like, all right, you're going in the room. And I'm like, okay, I'm ready. And I found out after recording in that studio, it was a tiny little vocal, the mic and everything it was a small space, right? And I'm a soccer, I was a soccer player. And I thought, oh, this is small. But after recording so quickly, and then actually in my third song, recording in this big space, I'm like, I don't want the big space. I learned that I like the small space. It makes me feel more confident. And, and so also, it's better than being in a big space as well, yeah, too. Yeah, exactly. And so, you know, with electronic dance music, there's a lot they can do in the on the board stuff to help those things along. But just as far as me just not being nervous, I just not nervous in a smaller space, which is the best conditions possible. And he gave me a couple of verses and, and I just stacked them for quite a long time. Um, I felt like in my impression and the, the, and they, I would come out of the room and they're like, okay, all right, we're moving on. We're going to write two more verses and a chorus. And I'm like, okay. And, and I said, that seemed like it took forever. And they're like, no, that was really fast. <laughs> so I was like, okay. So by the time we had everything done and we fed off each other, I, I would come up with key words that would replace some of his ideas and key lines and things like that. So I'd say co-writing on the second song was probably 60, 40, um, me and him. So it was really exciting. And then they started doing production and just working with the production for a while. So I just say, they made me ramen and I started eating ramen and drinking. <laughs> and that's a perfect food for Amico. And I grew up with that and uh, making very fancy ramen. And I ended up the first playback. And they're like, we're not done. We're not done. We're not, we're not even be done today. Yeah, like I'm going to you know, take this to my personal studio and we're going to, I'm going to remix it and all kinds of stuff's going to happen. But this is what your voice is going to sound like essentially. And they were, Artan Kaleshi and the sound engineer and Carlos were standing right by me and we were facing the, the screen where you could see the different things going on the screen yeah, electronically. Yeah. And I heard my voice and I started to cry. I'm like, I just looked. I, I, I kind of turned to them and they all hugged me because I was crying because it sounded like a hit to me. And I thought, that's not even possible. I, I didn't even think it was possible that I could hear that and experience that so fast. And so it was a turning point for me because my first 
recording was special, very special. And Jason had to talk me into it a little bit because I always thought well, I'm going to write for other people. And he's, you have to start singing if you want anybody to take you as a writer. <laughs> He's like, yeah, if you want to write for famous people, you've got to, this is the path. So I'm like, okay, I guess I'll do it in Dallas. And we recorded with this great couple here and a very talented Stephen and Delaney Coleman married couple. And so we, we just embraced each other. And I just started to dance around the floor and we were dancing and we were doing the whole like this. Yeah, yeah. Now, so that was the experience that I had. It was an incredible experience. Makes everything else worth it. <laughs> great. Where can people find you on social media? So I am everywhere on social media. Uh, I have a YouTube page. It's official Amy Co. Official Amy Co. is my Instagram, my my talk. I don't spend a lot of time on Snapchat or Threads. I think it's what is it called? Threads? Yeah, Threads. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, Facebook, I, I used a lot right away, right after Hat Trick. But I don't have, I'm managing my own social media and I do have some content that's made for me, but some of it I made myself. <laughs> and so you can tell. Um, but, but the lane, I, when I discovered the lane for me was more marketing towards a soccer market that appreciates music as a byproduct, mm -hmm. I started to see real uh, movement. Like I, if I did an ad on something where I was marketing to music, it was game over. Nothing happened. And for half the price or 25%, I just started using, I, I researched like the mentions and stuff, the most robust mentions where every mention I had was like millions and millions of people, right? Following yeah, yeah. So I just stacked that. And so with a little bit of advertising and some experimentation, I, I discovered being more overt with my branding. Because I thought when I first started the idea of being the first singing soccer coach in the world, it would be, you know... <laughs> <laughs> implicit, not explicit. And it turns out that there's quite an interest in that specific idea. Really. Fabulous. Um, 